morning, everyone. My name is Pastor Chris. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. Pleasure to be with you all this morning. Let me uh, pray for us as we open up God's Word. Father, we pray uh, that the truths we just sang about in that song would, would hit us even more uh, and, and pierce our hearts this morning. Lord, that it's by your amazing grace only that we're saved and that that's how we can be set free um, and we can call you ours as, as we're yours. So help us now, God, give us open, open ears and open hearts to receive what you have to say to us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we're going to continue our series called Good News in the book of Romans this morning. You can go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 9. We'll start at the end of the chapter today. So uh, most people want to feel that they're a good person, right? We all want to feel that we're one of the good ones, or at least that we're not one of the bad ones, right? Um, and and it's, it's a long-held assumption by psychologists as well that we have this, this drive to feel morally good, that we all want to, want to justify ourselves, right? Uh, our desire to be morally good, it might be one of the basic uh, core needs that we have, psychologically speaking, but there's a problem. We have this thing called a conscience, right? And, and our conscience convicts us. It reminds us that we're not good. Even, even though we say we, we want to be good and we feel this need to be good, we know that we're not. We know we should be better. And so there's this, this tension between what we want to be and what we really are. And there are a lot of ways to relieve that tension. Uh, you can compare yourself to other people and feel superior to them and say, oh, I'm not that bad. Uh, you, can, you can change the standards of what's good. You can kind of rationalize it. I mean, we do that all the time. It's really easy. We, uh, you know, the same way that you rationalize and change the rules a little bit over time. You know, anytime you have a diet or something like that, right? Like, a Snickers bar isn't really candy, right? I mean, it's got peanuts. It's, it's kind of a granola bar when you think about it, you know? So this is fine, right? It's, we're, we're great at rationalizing and kind of changing the rules a little bit. Or, or you just ignore the, the tug of your conscience. If you ignore your conscience for long enough, then eventually it'll be quiet. But the Bible puts it this way in, in Romans chapter 1. This is how we uh, relieve that tension. It says we suppress the truth. We know that there's this, this truth about the universe that there's right and wrong, and we know that we're doing wrong, but we relieve that tension by suppressing the truth. And it says our minds are darkened. We tell ourselves lies, and ignorance is bliss. But in the grand scheme of things, the, the Bible says that doesn't help because we have a more critical need than just our, our need to relieve that that tension we feel inside. There's actually a bigger problem. The the internal tension points to an external problem that we all have, and that's that we need to get right with God. It's not just that uh, we need to feel morally good. It's that we need to be morally good before God. There really is a God who who made the world and everything in it, And, and he built moral laws into the world in the same way that he built physical laws into the universe, like E equals MC squared. In the same way, there's, there's a right and wrong that's objectively true. And every one of us has broken that moral law. We've sinned against God. And so we're accountable to the creator and judge of the universe. That's the real tension that we need to resolve. So how do we get right with God? That's the problem that the Apostle Paul kind of assumes that we understand as we come to our passage today. He spent the beginning of his letter kind of laying out that problem, that we're we're not right with God, and then he starts to unpack what's the solution to that. And in our passage today, Paul explains how we can be righteous in God's sight. And there's really only one way, which he'll show us. But he does this with a heavy heart. It's not just, you know, uh, cold theology, right? He, He has a heavy heart as he explains this because he realizes that his own ethnic group, his own people, the Jewish people, They haven't taken this one way of righteousness that could save them. His people are lost. They're going the wrong way. And so Paul is is grappling with this sad reality, and he's trying to understand why. Like, why aren't they saved? And it's it's not just a Jewish problem. Why isn't anyone saved? Why, why, Why is anybody unsaved in the world? Maybe that's a question you've wrestled with yourself. Why is this family member or... Uh, this friend or this group of people on the other side of the world, why aren't they saved? And the conclusion Paul draws in our passage is this. Here's kind of the main 
thrust of the passage today. People are lost because they've chosen the wrong way to righteousness. We, we feel this pull to, to be right with God, and we know that we need that, but people take the wrong way to get there. People are unsaved because of their own choice. Now, if you were here last week, you might be thinking, wait a minute, I, I thought that people were unsaved because of God's choice. Isn't, isn't he the one who's, who's in control? And that's also true. Those, those two truths, Paul puts them back to back in this letter. It's God's choice and it's people's choice. Now, when it comes to how God's sovereign, sovereignty over the universe and, and human responsibility, how, how they fit together, I think there's, uh, that, that's something that we won't ever fully work out in our mind exactly how that works. I think you know, Pastor Sam did a great job of explaining that last week. But it's something where there's always going to be a little bit of uh, tension in our minds. There, there's some degree of mystery to God that you're never going to be able to fully work out. In the same way that uh, Jesus is both fully man and fully God. It's something we see in Scripture, and so we believe it, but you're never going to be able to systematize that in your mind exactly how that works out and, and, and for it to be completely satisfying. In the same way, somehow God is 100% in control of his universe, and at the same time, people are 100% in control of all the choices that they make, including how they respond to God. And there's there's really no analogy that does it justice, but I want to try. Uh, This is kind of how I picture it. Uh, The the universe is like this incredibly complex drama, right? It's like a, a, a play going on on the stage up here, and it's got billions and billions of actors all acting at once. And, and all of them are improvising. They're not given the script. They just do exactly what they want. They, they move and they say whatever they want to. They, re- they make real choices. They're improvising. But somehow the, the result is this beautiful story, and it goes exactly according to the script that the director has. It's exactly what he wanted, down to every last detail, every movement, every word. And so was, the dra- was the, that drama the result of the actor's choices or the director's choices? And somehow the answer is both. And last week we, we looked at the drama of redemption from, uh, from the perspective of the director, God, and this week we're looking at it from the perspective of the actors, us. So once again, the main point of our passage is this. People are lost because they've chosen the wrong way to righteousness. It's, it's by our choice if we're not saved. And that's a bit of a, an offensive point, as, as we'll talk about later. These days, many people claim that all religions are the same, right? They're just, they're just different, different ways up to the top of the same mountain. They're different ways to God or to, to eternity, whatever it may be. But the Apostle Paul in Scripture here, he disagrees. He says there's only one path to the top. And so, ultimately, you can, uh, you can boil it down to the one way, the right way, or the wrong way. It's an either-or. So, that's what we'll see in our passage today. We're, we're going to divide this passage into three sections, and in each one, we're going to see a contrast between the wrong way and the right way. There's an either-or. We'll see the right way to God and the wrong way to be counted righteous before God. So, let's read our first section. We'll start in Romans 9, verse 30. So you can turn there in your Bibles. We'll also have it up on the screens. And we're going to go through verse 10, uh, chapter 10, verse 4. Romans 9.30. What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith? But the people of Israel who pursued the law as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. <coughs> Excuse me. 
All right, we'll stop right there. So, that's our first section. Here's the contrast we see in this first section. Christ is either the way or in the way. He's either the thing that saves you or he's the thing that makes you stumble. He's either the way or in the way. And tragically, for Paul's own people that he describes here, Christ has been a stumbling block. Paul starts this section with this shocking reality for him in in verses 30 and 31. It's the reality that the Gentiles, who did not pursue righteousness, have obtained it. Meanwhile, the people of Israel have pursued righteousness, but they haven't attained it. It seems like there's been this mix-up. It's like, it's like God saved the wrong people. See, God has counted Gentiles, non-Jews, as righteous. But if we look at the long span of history, it's like these people weren't even trying to obey God. They weren't trying to be righteous, at least not by God's standards. Uh, here's, here's kind of a, a snapshot of the— Thanks, Mario. <laughs> uh, here's a, a snapshot of the, the pagan Roman world of the first century. Just a few, a few points. Um, prostitution of all kinds was legal and commonplace. Uh, even for married men, it was just a common thing. Another major pastime in the, in the Gentile world was going to the arena, watching the, the gladiator games, right? Watching people fight to the death or, be, uh, or fight to the death with wild animals and be devoured, right? But it was, it was no big moral conundrum because they were just slaves or, you know, prisoners of war, right? No big deal. And uh, infant exposure was also commonplace in those days. So, uh, meaning that if you had a newborn that you didn't want, say because it was a girl or had a disability of some kind, it it was perfectly acceptable to just leave it outside somewhere to fend for itself and probably die uh, or maybe be picked up by somebody else and made a slave. So, the bottom line, I mean, these these are all practices that are, like, heinous to us, right? So, the bottom line is, They had suppressed the moral truths that are obvious to many of us. They they were living by their own set of morals and rejecting God. Meanwhile, for thousands of years, the Jewish people, they had been trying to obey the law of God that he had given them himself to Moses. Over 600 laws, uh, and, and many of them protecting those very people who in other societies in the ancient world Uh, were exploited and dehumanized. Uh, Slaves, women, children, including the unborn, uh, foreigners, were protected by the law of God. Right, so the Jewish people were were trying to obey God, were trying to be righteous, and yet, somehow, they're not saved. The people who, who didn't obey God and could have cared less somehow have obtained righteousness, and the people who are trying to get righteousness have not gotten it. How does that happen? How can it be that the godless, lawless Gentiles have obtained righteousness before God? It's kind of like God mixed up, right? Like he's rewarded the wrong people. And we hate that, don't we? Right? Like, okay, uh, were any of you um, like mediocre athletes growing up in school? Okay, yeah. So, so people like, people like us, if we wanted to make the team, if we wanted to get on the starting squad, we actually had to try, right? We actually had to practice, we had to work, right? But inevitably, there's always that one guy who barely comes to practice, shows up late for the game, but he's still a starter, right? And, it, you know, he never has to try, but he's just, like, naturally talented, and that's rewarded. But we don't, we don't feel that's right, right? We, we think that, naturally, hard work should be rewarded, don't we? And, you know, if, if you were, um, were going to watch a documentary or something, you want to see somebody who who rose up from nothing, right? Who really had to work for it, and then that was rewarded with greatness. We think hard work should be rewarded. And that's precisely why the gospel is offensive to good, hardworking people like us. The gospel is not fair, not in the way that you think it should be. Look what Paul says in uh, chapter 9, verse 32. He tells us why the Jews sought righteousness but didn't attain it. Verse 32, why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, see, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble, a rock that makes them fall, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. That's speaking about Christ. So the Jews of Paul's day, they believed that God would count them righteous based on their work to obey the law. 
how well they followed the law of Moses, whether they kept the commandments, whether they ate the correct foods and avoided the wrong foods, whether they did all the, the proper religious ceremonies. Like many of us, they believe that God ought to have this system that rewards hard work, doing the proper thing. But Jesus and his disciples, they came preaching a totally different system. That God rewards those who put their faith in Jesus. And so to most of the Jews, that's, that's a totally different system, right? Jesus didn't sound like the Messiah. He sounded like a heretic. Paul's fellow Jews took offense at the idea of righteousness by faith alone, apart from works. Righteousness that could be obtained by these uncircumcised Gentiles who hadn't given a rip about God and his law. So for the Jews, Christ was this stone that caused them to stumble. And yet, at, at the same time, Paul was seeing that for these Gentiles, for those who, who Christ became the cornerstone, the, 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 the very basis of their righteousness before God, they were being saved in droves because they were just putting their faith in, the, in Jesus. Jesus will either save you or make you stumble. And the gospel is just as freeing and just as offensive today as it was back then. The gospel says righteousness comes simply through faith in Jesus. And the gospel says righteousness comes only through faith in Jesus. He's the way and he's the only way. And so the gospel still offends people today just as much as in Paul's day. But the ironic thing is it offends people for the opposite reason. See, it, it offended the Jewish people of Paul's day because this gospel was too inclusive. Like, what? These Gentiles are, are getting in? They can be counted righteous? It's too inclusive. These days, people are offended because it's too exclusive. It's, it's only Christ? Well, what about, uh, you know, that, that creates this question in our minds. Well, what about, you know, my Muslim classmate who's, uh, who's a really devout Muslim? And what about uh, my neighbor who, they're not really religious, but they're like the nicest person I've ever met? And uh, what about my, my Jewish friend who, you know, they believe a lot of the same things and um, they practice their faith and, and they're really kind and generous? How can you say that they're not saved? Well, I would say the same thing about them that Paul said at the beginning of chapter 10 here, verses 1 to 2, what he said about the Israelites of his day. He said, My heart's desire and prayer to God is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. See, I want them to be saved. Just like you, we want them to be saved. And yet, without believing in Christ, they won't be. God's standard is not how hard you tried to be good. God's standard is not how earnest you were in your practice of your religion. It's not how much zeal you have. Zeal is worthless if it isn't based on knowledge if it isn't zeal for the truth. I can sympathize with people who are devoutly religious and yet don't know Christ because I was there. And Paul can sympathize with these, with these good religious people because he was once one of them. No one was more devout in their practice of Judaism than Paul was. But he came to realize that he was pursuing righteousness by the wrong way. So whether it's by Judaism or Islam or Buddhism or some, you know, uh, some uh, Christian type of uh, religion where, where you say you, you're following Christ and you try to do good works, you're trying to earn your righteousness by being good, whatever you, you call your religion, if it's based on your works, then it's not the way to salvation that actually works that Paul's describing here. Look what Paul says in verse 3. He says, those, all those ways are seeking to establish your own righteousness. But that won't get you anywhere with God. Instead, we need to submit to God's righteousness that he's provided in Christ. We don't earn our own righteousness. We don't establish our own righteousness. We accept what he gives us. All those other pursuits are, are ways of trying to measure up to God and to his standard. To be saved by law following. Do this and don't do that. And then you'll be good enough. But Paul says Christ is the culmination or the end of the law. And so we aren't saved by law following. Christ is what the law always pointed to. And once 
he arrived, once Jesus arrived and perfectly obeyed the law for us, then we're freed from law following. We don't have to be saved in that way. Christ is the end, the finish line for the law. He's like the finish line of the race, right? Once you get to the, to the finish line, the race is over. You don't keep running. The race is over with Christ. And if you're still trying to run, if you're still trying to win righteousness on your own efforts, it's like you've, you've blown past the finish line. You're, you're still running clear out of the stadium. You're still running, but what for? You might be running farther and faster than everyone else, but you're actually getting farther from the finish line. You're getting farther from Christ. And the, the, the medals are handed out at the finish line. Righteousness is a prize that God gives to anyone who stops running, stops trying to earn their own righteousness, and simply trusts in Christ, turns to him in faith. Everyone who trusts in Jesus and says, it is finished because of what he did on the cross. It's not a salvation that's just for Jews or just for Gentiles. It's not a salvation just for good religious people. It's for everyone who believes, as Paul says in verse 4. There's righteousness through Christ for everyone who believes. All right, now let's look to our next section, which is going to be verses 5 to 13 of chapter 10. So here Paul explains why the faith-based righteousness is totally unlike law-based righteousness. One way is simple. The other way is impossible. Let's read starting in verse 5. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Stop there. So this section, it's, it gives us our second contrast between the right way and the wrong way. And the second contrast is this. Salvation is either simple or impossible. It's either simple or impossible, depending which way you choose. And Paul makes his argument by quoting a, a bunch of quotations from the Old Testament, a bunch in a row, which makes it a little bit hard to follow. Uh, but it, it boils down to this. Achieving salvation through law following is impossible. But gaining salvation through Christ is simple. He only gives one verse to this wrong way, only verse 5. Verse 5, he said, Moses, Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. Emphasis on doing the things. In other words, if you rely on the law, then you'll live or die based on whether you do it. Whether you do what the law says. The law can only count you righteous if you obey the law. All of it. If you break any of it, then you're a lawbreaker. If you keep it perfectly, then you're righteous. Here's the problem. None of us can keep the law perfectly. Paul proved that in the first three chapters of his letter. That was his whole point. And back in Romans 3.20, he drew this conclusion. He said, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. So the law is the wrong way to righteousness. You can't be counted good by law-keeping because you'll never keep all of it. So the law actually serves to, to highlight our sin. It exposes, it shows us who we really are. It can't make us good. It can only make us conscious that we're not good. But thankfully, there's an alternative to law-keeping, and it's not difficult. In fact, anyone can do it. It's like Paul's saying this. Here's kind of a, a classic illustration. It's like, look, there's this, there's this massive gap between us and God, between us and righteousness. We're separated from God because of our sin. It's like, it's like a canyon a mile wide. 
That's how big the gap is. And there are two ways across. Two ways. You can choose. One way is to get a good running start and jump. See if you can make it. If you want to try that way, be my guest. Just, just realize that you won't be saved by that way unless you jump the whole mile. You got to go the whole way. Even if you jump farther than everyone else, even if you jump halfway, even if you jump 5,279 feet, you're a goner. You didn't go the whole mile. And, but you can choose that way if you want. But there's another way to bridge that gap. It's to take the bridge. There's a bridge laid by Christ that spans the gap. He was the only one who was perfectly righteous, and we can be saved. We can have his righteousness. And so we can walk across the bridge. All you have to do is trust the bridge and walk across. Paul calls this bridge the righteousness that is by faith. In verses 6 to 8, he quotes from Deuteronomy 30 in the Old Testament, where Moses warned the Israelites not to excuse themselves from obeying God by claiming God didn't make his will known. He knew that the Israelites would be tempted to blame God and, and be like, God never told us what we were supposed to do. It's not our fault. But God had clearly revealed his will in Scripture. The, the, the word was near to them, he said. And today, people make the same excuse. They say, how are we supposed to know how to get right with God? He hasn't made it clear. Why is God so hidden? If he's real, why doesn't he reveal himself to us? Why doesn't he show us the truth? But in reality, God has made it clearer than ever. He's shown us, you, you don't have to climb the mountain. You don't have to, you don't have to go up to heaven and, and find the, the spiritual truth that will save you. God has come down to you in human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. He's revealed the way of salvation to you. There's no secret knowledge you need. There's no riddles you have to solve. There's no hoops you have to jump through. Salvation is not for the strong or the smart or the special. It's not for those who follow this plan of self-improvement. It's for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, as Paul says in verse 13. Everyone who genuinely believes in Jesus, trusts him for salvation, and walks across will be saved. Everyone who depends on Christ for their, for their righteousness will be counted righteous. Justified. It's that simple. Now, I want to be clear about something in this passage. Uh, when Paul talks about declaring with your mouth and believing in your heart, he's really talking about the same thing. Uh, it's not an extra requirement. The, the one requirement that you need for salvation is faith, which is in your heart. But that's almost always accompanied by declaring with your mouth what you believe, declaring your faith publicly. Just like in the New Testament, it's almost always accompanied with baptism. Right? You're not saved by getting baptized or by saying a certain prayer, saying certain words. You're saved by faith. But you declare it with your mouth. You declare it publicly by getting baptized. There's this outward expression of your faith. Salvation is simply by faith. But Paul says faith is the one thing that the Jewish people lack. That's why he's so grieved. That's why they're lost. And so to drive the point home, uh, he addresses one final objection in verses 14 to the end. You know, some people might say, well, you know, maybe they didn't get the message about Jesus. Maybe no one told them. Maybe they didn't hear. And so they have an excuse. So let's see what Paul says about that objection, starting in verse 14. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Okay, so pause there for a second. So, Paul starts by acknowledging something. There's, uh, in order for the good news about Jesus to be believed, there are certain things that need to happen. The, the good news has to be heard, right? And it can't be heard unless someone's preaching it. And nobody's preaching it unless they're sent to preach it. So there's this chain of events that has to happen. But in Israel's case, in Israel's case, the missing link is not the sending or the preaching or the hearing. It's just that last link, belief. That's, that's the point that he makes uh, as we continue here. Let's continue in verse 16. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? 
Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Again, I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, All day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. So Paul says, The good news was preached to Israel, but most didn't accept it. We can see that in the New Testament. Go back to the Gospels in the book of Acts. Jesus went first to the Jews. That was his number one priority. And, and the early church was all Jewish. And once they faced opposition from many of the Jews, then they spread out to the Gentiles. So not only did Israel hear the gospel, they heard it, but not only that, they understood it as well. Right? It's not, it's not a complicated message. Believe in Jesus the Messiah and you'll be saved. It's so simple that uh, these pagans with no understanding, as, as the quote says, people without understanding, no understanding of God, not seeking God, those people understood it. So why not God's chosen people, Israel? And Paul again quotes the Bible to show that all of this was predicted in the Jewish scriptures. They were warned. Uh, they were warned that the gospel was going to go out beyond Israel's borders to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles were going to be brought into the family of God. But to them, the people God's been holding his hand out to the whole time, inviting them to believe in him, the people of Israel, they've rejected him. So here's the point of this final section. The gospel is either accepted or rejected. That's the ultimate either or. The gospel is either accepted or rejected. Salvation hinges upon a choice a fork in the road. Will you accept the good news or will you reject it? Now, at this point, the Israelites have chosen wrongly. But what about you? What, what do we do? What will you do with the gospel? Some of you, you've, you've trusted in Christ already. You're saved. And for you, this passage is a reminder to cling to that hope. Cling to salvation just by faith in Christ. Don't, don't waver from that and think, start thinking that it's by works and it's by what you do. And it's also a, a reminder that there are others who are lost. And it, it's our job, our privilege, to go to them with the good news and to share it with them. They can't believe it unless they hear it, unless someone preaches it to them. And it's not, it's not just the job of preachers. It's all of us who have this good news to share. So God is calling you to share the good news with the people in your life who don't know it. Others of you, though, you're in the same position as Israel. As Israel, You've heard the message. You've understood the message, I hope. If, you, if it wasn't clear, let's, let's talk afterwards. But you've heard the message. You've understood it. Maybe, maybe this is the first time you've heard the gospel message. Maybe this is the 500th time you've heard the message. But for some of you, Despite hearing it, despite understanding it, you haven't accepted it. You haven't trusted in Christ. Let me explain it this way. Salvation by faith, it's kind of like skydiving. You need a bit of knowledge if you're going to skydive, uh, but you also need trust. You need knowledge and trust. So you need to know something. You need to know that, that when you jump from a plane, your only hope of Getting to the ground safely is a parachute. You need a parachute, and you need, need to know the basics of how to use it. Like, you, you pull this cord. That's how it works. Right? You know, and you need to know that trying to flap your wings, it's not going to work. Okay? There's a right way and a wrong way to skydive. Likewise, you need to know, when it comes to our sin problem, Christ is the only way to be saved. He's, he's like your parachute, and he never fails if you trust in him. Trying to earn your righteousness, it's like trying to flap your wings to a soft landing. It's not going to work. It's, it's zeal without knowledge. You need knowledge, but you also need trust. See, there are many people who sign up to go skydiving 
They, they, they take the classes. They know how a parachute works. They know how to use one. And they stand in the, in the door of the airplane looking out, and they can't bring themselves to jump. They, they can't bring themselves to trust in that parachute. I've, I've been told that in the Air Force, in, in jump school, you only got two chances to go up and make that jump. That's your last chance before you're kicked out of jump school. You're not going to be jumping out of planes. I don't know how many chances you're going to have to accept the gospel. It could be many, many more. It might not be. We could, we could die tomorrow. I do know that your chances are limited because our life is limited. So what will you do with the gospel? Your time is limited, but today can be the day that you trust Jesus and you can be saved. Let's pray. Father, I pray that uh, anything that I've said that isn't clear would be forgotten, uh, but whatever you want to speak to people, whatever truth from this passage you want to speak, that you would impress that upon people's hearts. Lord, I pray for genuine conviction of sin. Uh, maybe for those of us who uh, have trusted in Christ long ago, but we've, we've gotten into a mode of thinking we get right with you by our works somehow. We started by grace, but now we're continuing by works, thinking we need to earn your, your approval. Lord, I pray that you'd turn us back to the grace of the gospel. And Lord, I pray especially for those who haven't trusted in Christ, Lord, that they would be drawn to you in faith, that they would surrender their lives to you, that they would stop trying to earn their righteousness and be good enough, and that they would believe that it's just through Jesus and what he did for them that they're saved. Lord, I pray for many, many lives changed by trusting in Christ, and that you would make us your vessels to tell others who aren't even in this room about the good news of Jesus. Thank you, God. We, we give you all the praise, all the glory, because of this amazing salvation that you've provided for us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.